When I was 16 and living in a foreign country, a man came up behind me and swiped his hand up my butt and then said things in a menacing way, but in a foreign language. And do you know what my response was? I said, I'm sorry, as if my butt had somehow forced his hand to grope it. Now that response makes no logical sense, but in the light of the Me Too movement, people are asking, why didn't she speak up? Or why didn't I fight back? Or why didn't I resist? And when one in three girls and one in five boys have been sexually assaulted, but the vast majority of them did nothing in the moment, they froze up, we as a society have to understand the freeze response if we're going to understand sexual assault. Every single survivor of sexual assault that I have met with in therapy froze during the assault. And most submitted and most felt shame. One in four of your Facebook friends has been sexually assaulted. Please share this video as one of them may need to hear this to forgive themselves. You may think of freezing up as just inaction, but it is much, much deeper than that. These are instincts that are deeply hardwired into our brain's survival center. We've been taught that we need to say no, to resist, to escape. But so, so often, victims feel paralyzed to do so. One survivor said, we're told that we need to respect ourselves enough to fight back. But that was the mystery to me. I did respect myself, but I could never bring myself to literally say the word no or fight back. My voice always just seemed to shrink away as my body went limp. Worse yet, sometimes I found myself smiling, hoping that by encouraging these behaviors in the moment, I could cooperate myself out of the situation. Just play along until you can escape, I thought. Not fighting back, not saying no, is not a form of consent or participation in a sexual act. It's actually your brain's most desperate attempt at survival. When we talk about our brain taking over in dangerous situations, we often talk about the fight or flight response. But the reaction, the freeze response, doesn't get much attention. This response is the result of our ancient brain flipping a switch, turning off our logic, turning off our thinking, and switching to the one and only option that is left to save our lives freezing. So let's look at this in nature for a second. Here's an example of a duck that is completely immobile in the presence of a much larger animal, a dog. And when the dog looks away, the duck's able to escape with its life. Now the survivor that I quoted previously said this, as a scientist, I conducted experiments on the stress response of birds. One phenomenon I've seen over and over is something called tonic immobility. We would trap these birds, handle them extensively, and put colorful bands on their legs to mark them. Now, understandably, all this could severely stress the bird, but when we released them, they usually didn't try to fight back or escape. We would carefully place them on the ground, and often they would lay just like that, perfectly immobile for several minutes before flying freely away. These birds' survival instincts overpowered their physical ability to fly away. They were stuck in freeze mode because their ancient instinctual brain decided that was the safest option. So this tonic immobility literally means that your brain turns off your muscles' ability to react in order to keep you alive. So why does sexual assault elicit a survival response? Rape and sexual assault isn't about sex. It's about power and control and dominance. Rape has been used as a tool of war through history to submit the populace to the invaders. It happened in World War II and the rape of Nanking and the Russian army entering Germany and many, many more wars through the history of the world. And if a woman who was being assaulted by an invading soldier fought back, she would probably just be killed. There was little hope of fleeing, freezing, submitting, cooperating 
were her best hopes of survival. And our anciently evolved brain knows that better than we can realize. In our modern culture of sexual harassment and assault, these reactions don't seem to function too well. But our ancient brain still defaults to these survival responses during threats. In 2001, there was a study on college-aged women in which subjects were asked highly inappropriate questions in a job interview setting. For example, do you wear bras to work? Do you find yourself sexually desirable? Their results show that gap between what we think we should or would do and our actions in the moment. So each of the women had previously said that if they were to be sexually harassed, they would respond by being confrontational, by leaving, by reporting it. But when it actually happened, not a single one of them reacted as they had imagined they would. Instead, the researchers saw a startling response in the video recordings of these interactions. The women sat patiently and answered the questions while smiling. Now, whether you find this validating or horrifying, another study showed 70% of sexual assault victims reported significant tonic immobility, and only around 5% of rape victims file a police report. And that's because speaking up is dangerous. Society shames them, their boss may fire them, romantic partners may shun them. But this freeze response isn't logical or planned, it's a reflex, an instinct, and a physiological reaction that's triggered by high-stress situations. Even if we wanted to scream or yell or kick, our brain ensures that our muscles are frozen because millions of years of evolution say that freezing is the safest response. And it's incredibly difficult to override our body's natural response in the moment. So let me show you an example. watch that video without feeling a little squeeze in your stomach or taking a sharp intake of breath? Your brain has powerful tools to manage danger and just like you couldn't stop those reactions from happening, a victim of sexual assault often can't just say no or fight back because this reaction, this tonic immobility, literally locks the muscles in place. The brain is more likely to force a freeze response in the face of overwhelming adversary. Women tend to be smaller, weaker, or of lower status than men. Men who are sexually assaulted are usually assaulted by an older, larger, or higher ranking individual, whether that be a pastor, teacher, coach, or prison inmate. The freeze response becomes the brain's only remaining mechanism. When that man grabbed my butt, I was alone on the streets of a foreign country. A language I didn't speak, my brain sized up the situation in a microsecond and made the decision for me. Be compliant and he'll go away, it said. And he did. My brain was right. It worked. During a sexual assault, we can risk death by trying to escape or fight or not. Doing our best to appease the dominant members of the tribe might allow us to escape with minimal bodily damage. So what do we do about this? Number one, stop blaming yourself or others for this response. It is a natural reaction. Your brain took over to save your life. A recent article on this ended with saying this is enough. And I can agree with that to a degree. You have to put the responsibility where it honestly lies, with the perpetrator. The crime is their responsibility. And that's a great first step. But this article basically said, I don't know what else you can do. Now, I don't have all the answers, but I do know from personal experience that you can train yourself to respond differently sometimes. In the years following my assault, I was trained in self-defense for one of my jobs, and I was trained to be a wilderness first responder with an excellent teacher who threw surprising and stressful situations upon us. So people would run into the classroom with their arm on fire, or they'd begin choking in class, uh, like, they, like they were acting, but 
Regardless, it was scary. And in the beginning, we all froze up. But we practiced and practiced our protocol until our new reaction was to take life-saving steps. So I trained my reaction to stress to be the behavior that I chose. So putting out the fire or performing the Heimlich maneuver. Now, training can replace reflexes. Now, after that class and after those self-defense courses, when I was 22, I returned to that foreign country where I'd been assaulted. And one day out on the streets with a friend, a group of young men walked aggressively toward us. One of them got in the face of my friend, inches from her face. And this time my reaction was different. Instead of freezing, submitting, or apologizing for taking up space, I hit him hard in the shoulder, hard enough to send him tumbling like somersaulting with a look of embarrassment. And we walked away safely. Now, that situation would have been different if they were bigger, more numerous, or armed. My brain probably still would have defaulted to freeze at that point, and there's no shame in that. Freezing serves a purpose, so don't beat yourself up over it. But in the face of sexual harassment at the workplace or in dating, I do believe we can intentionally train ourselves to respond differently to these attacks. I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I wish victims didn't even have to deal with this. If there weren't perpetrators out there, then we wouldn't need to take so many actions to increase our safety. But that being said, can I have it both ways? Can I say it's not your fault you froze and you can train yourself to respond differently in the future. And the real responsibility for this rests on the perp, and we should take our own safety into our own hands. Now, if I can have it both ways, then I say, take a rape aggression defense class or two. Actively begin to retrain your stress response through exposure to safe yet stressful experiences like rock climbing, martial arts, or exposure therapy. Practice role plays so your brain has a couple of default options to choose from if you happen to be assaulted or harassed. But above all, let's work toward understanding ourselves and each other with compassion. Be kind to yourself and others who have experienced sexual assault. Judgment and blame simply aren't helpful. I believe that we as a culture can take action towards stopping sexual assault and harassment, but to do that we need to understand why survivors act the way they do in the face of danger. My mission is to create mental health resources that are easy to access so that people know how to help others with mental illness. I've got courses on udemy.com with mental health basics and how to help family and friends with mental illness. I'm currently working to make more courses on trauma, so check out my website if you'd like to learn more. And please share this message. Thanks for watching and take care.